10 days ago, the word of this year was announced. Anybody know what it is? Well, let me help you. It's in the title of this talk, and it's not privacy. So yeah, it's AI, or artificial intelligence. So let's talk about it. There is two kinds of AI, narrow and general. Narrow AI focuses on specific tasks with given rules, such as playing chess or Go. So these games have a closed world and a small set of simple rules. So the AI can just play a bunch of matches with itself. And actually, it can learn from these matches. So it does not need training data. On the other hand, general AI focuses on more complex problems where not necessarily exist such set of rules. For instance, generating images or making conversation. So there are no explicit rules what makes a dog a dog or how to respond to specific questions in a conversation. So for this, the AI needs training data. It needs a bunch of pictures of a dog and a lot of conversations between actual humans so it will learn what makes a dog a dog and how to, what are the appropriate answers to particular questions. So let me give you just a glimpse of how much data these models need. The state-of-the-art image generators were trained on tens and hundreds of millions of images. Just going through one million would take around 100 days if you spent 10 seconds with every picture. Actually, I used one such a model to illustrate this talk. Concerning the state-of-the-art text generators, they are trained on multiple terabytes of data, where reading only a single terabyte would take an average human 2,000 years. If you imagine that the uh, average human would live that long and has no better things to do. So clearly, these models need a lot of data. But how can the companies collect such a vast amount of data? Well, if you use their services, then you probably agreed to the terms and conditions. So basically, they have your consent to collect and process whatever data, for whatever reason, written in the fine prints. And that can be anything, because no one ever reads that. So, for example, a social network can see your pictures, your posts, and even your messages. And then it can use that data to train an AI model on that. What is more, they are actually watching you even outside of their domain by tracking. So they can target you with personalized advertisement. So this is the reason why you can see an ad about the exact pair of shoe you just bought on another website. So they know a lot about you, way more than you think. On the other hand, this information, which they know and they collect and process, might be personal or even sensitive. So it has to be protected by some law, right? Well, it is, in fact, protected in many countries. Here in Hungary, we have the EU-wide GDPR, stands for General Data Protection Regulation, forbids the collection and the processing of many data types, such as sexual preference or ethnicity. So with these laws in place, we are protected, right? Well, actually, seemingly innocent data could still contain sensitive information. Let's see, for example, likes. Researchers trained an AI model which, based on only 10 likes, is able to predict someone's personality type better than his or her colleagues. And after knowing 300 likes, the AI could even outperform the partners of the individuals. So let me repeat this. 300 likes contain enough information to know someone's personality better than the spouse with whom they might raise children. Or let's look at another example, selfies. Another AI model based on five selfies could predict your sexual orientation with around 80%. In contrast, humans can do this with around 60%. So clearly, there is some hidden information in the selfie which makes this possible. We do not see this, but the AI surely does. And these were just only two examples out of many. So the bottom line is that anything can be sensitive, because today's insensitive data can be turned into sensitive by tomorrow's AI models. So this looks bad, right? Companies know a lot about us, and many, if not all, of that information carries sensitive details about us. So what can we do? Well, 
that's the question I'm not going to answer today because I wanted to focus on the other side, so what the companies can or should do. So how can they utilize our data while also preserving our privacy? And basically, the goal is to break the connection between the person and the data. So whatever sensitive information is in the data, that cannot be traced back to a real person. And in fact, this is the promise of anonymization. So we want to anonymize, but how? Well, the first idea would be to remove all direct identifiers from the data, such as names and social security numbers. So this way, no unique information is remained. So we should be safe, right? Well, this is kind of naive, because even motivational posters know that we are unique, and not because of our ID numbers. And I can confirm that, because the data would still contain undirect identifiers which alone might not be unique, such as the zip code, but the combination could be unique. And in fact, it was shown that 87% of the US population is unique, based on only the combination of their birthday, their zip code, and their gender. So essentially, knowing just a few information about someone would make it pretty easy to re-identify him or her in an anonymized database. So clearly, we have to do more we have to make the records less unique. And k-anonymity does just that. It requires that if it's a specific combination of undirect identifiers are present in the data, then it has to be present at least k times. So what does it mean for us? It means that the specific combination of a zip code, a gender, and a birthday, if it's present in the data, then it's present multiple times. And one way to achieve this is by generalization. So for instance, using just the first few digits of a zip code instead of the entire code. This way, even if I know someone, like John, I cannot pinpoint who he is in the anonymized records. So we achieved what we wanted. The connection between the real person and the data is uh, broken. So we are safe, right? I cannot know what John's sensitive information is, whether he's healthy or sick, similarly to Schrodinger's cat. Well, sorry to disappoint, but this protection is still not enough. And the problem is that we focused on reducing the uniqueness instead of reducing the sensitive information leakage. You see, what if I play football with John on every Sunday? In that case, I would assume he's healthy, right? On the other hand, accessing the anonymized records would change this belief arbitrarily. And actually, k-anonymity does not protect against this at all. So basically, this leakage, the change in my belief, could be arbitrarily high. So it could be even a zero or a hundred percent, implying that the secret information is completely leaked. How can we stop this? Or how can we at least limit this kind of information leakage? And the answer is randomization. So instead of generalizing the data, we can add random noise to it. So let's take, for example, gender. We can toss a coin to decide whether we keep this data or randomize it. And if we randomize it, then we can toss another coin to decide how we should set it. And basically, we can randomize the other attributes as well. And our goal is to distort the individual data just enough to break the connection between the data and the person, but not too much. So the general statistics and the general patterns in the data remain unchanged. And to do that, we actually need to use a noise which is balanced and not too large. So what do I mean by that? So it should be 50-50 if the birthday would change to an earlier or later day, and it should be more likely that only the day would change and less likely than the year two. So this way, we created uncertainty. So whatever sensitive information leaks from the data, we have to take it with a grain of salt, because it not might even be true. Actually, adding noise is beneficial for a bunch of other reasons besides privacy. But for now, let's stick with that. So if we add noise in a clever way, then we can even achieve differential privacy. And uh, what is differential privacy? So differential privacy ensures that a single piece of information 
cannot have a large impact on the outcome. So what does it mean for us? It means that it should be very hard to tell whether John's data was used or not in generating this anonymized data set. And essentially, it would even incentivize data sharing because uh, John's data would remain undetectable. So there is no reason why he should not share it. Differential privacy is beneficial for both sides because on one hand, the exact records are hidden, so the individual privacy is protected. On the other hand, the companies are not even interested in that. They are interested in the general correlations in the data. And differential privacy does not change that. So basically, it is the ultimate solution. If we imagine that a person is a tree and its information are the leaves, then differential privacy allows the company to walk the forest and study it at large, but without looking at any leaf in particular. Differential privacy also comes with a mathematical guarantee that a belief cannot change too much. And that's exactly what we wanted. The question is, what is too much? Well, that depends on the noise we added. So the more noise we add, the less this belief can change, and hence the higher the privacy protection. On the other hand, there is no such a thing as free lunch. So basically, by adding noise, the accuracy of the data would also decrease. So there is a clear trade-off here. Uh, anonymization, or in general, privacy protection, is not a black or white game, but rather a compromise, where the question is how much accuracy you need to sacrifice to provide the desired level of privacy protection. OK, but how does this relate to AI? Well, the thing is that differential privacy is a property of a process, which means that basically any process can be done in a differentially private way. So not just anonymization, but for instance, training an AI model. So let me give you an example. So let's assume we have a social network, and the social network have a bunch of messages from its users. On the other hand, the messages might contain sensitive information, such as Mary's social security number. So if the company trains a chatbot based on this data, then this chatbot would be quite clever. And how we measure that? We measure it by the probability of giving the correct answers to questions. And this chatbot looks like it's giving us with the right answer with high probability. On the other hand, this chatbot might memorize sensitive data also. And with some probability, it would even leak it. Uh, of course, the company can just filter the chatbot responses or clean the data in advance. But unfortunately, none of those mechanisms come with any formal guarantee. On the other hand, differential privacy has a mathematical guarantee that if you train a chatbot in a differentially private way, then this chatbot has to be similar to another chatbot which was not trained on Mary's social security number. And this would immediately imply that the probability of replying with the exact social security number has to be pretty much the same as with replying with just a random number. So Mary's secret would be safe. But at what cost? The accuracy of the model would slightly decrease. Today, only a handful of companies care about our privacy, because most of them are chasing better and better models. But I think targeting only accuracy is careless. And we should, at least pay, we should at least consider to pay the premium for a more privacy-friendly AI. But until then, we should all be mindful what we share and where we share it. Thank you very much.